Welcome back to A Fine Time for Healing, a place where your physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being are all that matter. So put your feet up, relax, and enjoy today's show. Today's show, today we're going to be talking about the Modern Trauma Toolkit with Dr. Christine Gibson, but we're going to call her Christy today. She is a family physician, trauma therapist, and author of the Modern Trauma Toolkit. I'm going to show you that right here with all my little flags in it. Um, she's also on social media as TikTok Trauma Doc <laughs> with more than 130,000 followers on TikTok. She has a master's in medical education and is halfway through a doctorate and has been involved in academics and education, creating Calgary's Fellowship in Health Equity. She runs an international nonprofit Global Family Med Foundation a cooperative and a new company to train professionals how to manage workplace trauma safer spaces training so today we're going to be talking about christy's book like i said the modern trauma toolkit and i know all of you are going to be very interested to hear this because um most of you have experienced trauma on some level and you'd like to know that there are really ways to heal this other than, or, or actually not necessarily heal it, but actually work with it um, other than what you may have heard. So welcome, Christy. It's so great to have you. It's great to be here, Randy. So, um, in chapter two, where you start off with trauma, you say um, trauma is not the thing that happened. It's the body's response to that thing. And this is Gabor Mate, who's, speaks beautifully to this. Um, I just want you to sort of elaborate a little bit on that because I think it's misunderstood that trauma is the thing, not the response. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that was what I came to understand too. Like we think of this, um, these experiences that we've had as traumatic events and that surely they would react in everyone's mind body system in the same way. And that's what I came to understand quite late in my career. But just in the last eight years that I've been deeply studying trauma, um, I now understand that you could have a family where the same event happens to three kids and one of them will grow up with that event not impacting them at all. Another might grow up in a freeze response and feeling really collapsed and shut down and not, not having any movement in their body. And the third person will be diagnosed with anxiety and ADHD, and they'll have a lot of movement and that restless fight and fight syndrome uh, symptoms locked in. And um, it's not the event. It's the way that our specific mind body responds to it. And um, I think it helps one of the many, many ways that it helps lower the shame because you can really see how it wasn't a choice. It wasn't something that you consciously decided this is how I'm going to respond to the event. It's really a reflex that happens in the midbrain area um, and nothing to be ashamed about. It was a protective thing that your brain tried to do. Exactly. And we, we should be very grateful to our brain for that because we, yeah. we'd have a psychotic split or a psychotic episode or something if our subconscious mind just doesn't kind of take over, but it's true. Um, you know, and, in the work that I do with narcissistic abuse, um, when people want to, I try to figure out where this narcissist came from. Um, you know, it, it's, it's helpful for them to understand not every child exposed to the abuse that promote, you know, that the narcissist came out of is going to be that way. And maybe none of them will be that way, but every child is trying to, is figuring it out a different way based on their temperament, temperament and the way they sort of download the experience. So I think that's a really, really important fact. Yeah, um, and I think a lot of um, psychologists and physicians don't understand this completely. So it's why um, I caution a lot of folks that not every practitioner is trauma informed, um, myself included. You know, a lot of the first part of my career, I didn't understand this. And if I saw somebody with a trauma response in front of me, 
our default as practitioners is sometimes to label them with a personality disorder, um, to claim that they're non-compliant if they're actually shut down, or to blame them as difficult if they are in fight and flight. Mm -hmm. And the more trauma informed we are, it doesn't necessarily make you know challenging behaviors easier, but it makes us have a really sig significantly different approach to it. I mean, I feel so much more hopeful if I can recognize what it is that's happening and, and know now that I have the tools. Thank you. It's so good to hear that from, you know, a professional because um, so many people come to me diagnosed as bipolar because they're, they're all over the place. They're, yeah. you know, but the thing is a doctor who understands bipolar is not going to do this because these people are up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, it's not like periods of this periods of that, but so many of my clients have been put on lithium, and it's just exacerbated the problems when really it's just a deep wound, a traumatic wound. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you say um, the DSM-5 includes a helpful definition of how trauma shows up in the body. And um, you talk about some major headings like intrusive symptoms. So what, um, how is it showing up in the body through intrusive symptoms? And, and I will say that even though I use big words like intrusive in the book, I tried really hard to keep the language accessible. So if I do say the word intrusive in the modern trauma toolkit, I'll be very quick to explain what that means because they, these, these, terms can be jargony. Um, and so much of what we do in medicine is kind of gatekeeping knowledge. And it's one of the reasons I joined TikTok is because I was like, wow, the people need to know this. So I'll, I'll just put that corollary out there because the, okay. the word intrusive is is complicated and it doesn't really make sense. Okay. Um, the way, the way that I think about it is the past is intruding on the present. And so it's sneaking in the door of the brain and knocking and saying, boo. And so a lot of that will show up as... Um, flashbacks and nightmares mm -hmm. and those tend to be perceived as a more visual experience but a lot of times it can be a flashback that's emotional so you get triggered by an emotion and you have an emotional flashback mm -hmm. or the flashback can involve your senses it can um be triggered by a sense of uh the sense of smell something that you hear um one of the places i work is refugee health and so they will be really triggered by fireworks and that's not something that we think of as physicians as being one of the most dangerous times mm. of the year would be, you know, a celebration where fireworks would be going off. And, you know, a lot of my folks will be cowered under the bed. So um, I, I think the idea of flashbacks needs to be broadened so that people can recognize it in themselves, especially emotional flashbacks. Okay. And, um, and then the, number two, you talk about avoidance symptoms. So what do you mean by that? Avoidance symptoms is when you start to get to know what your triggers are or you anticipate being triggered by something and you just don't go near it so for some people it's people and they just become kind of hermits and they're insular and they don't want to leave the house because every time they do they encounter some emotional and even physical yes. pain mm -hmm. um but for other folks it's just trying to avoid certain situations or sensory input that might be harmful. So um, avoidance tends to be avoidance of pain, which is very protective, mm -hmm. but sometimes that system gets overactive and we just start to avoid things that um, are probably gonna be okay or neutral, or it really affects our mm -hmm. life to be that avoidant. It sort of builds on itself, yeah. you know, because the more you isolate, the more you feel the need to isolate and the scarier the world becomes. and um, I know this is an issue with pretty much all my clients who are adult children of narcissistic abuse. Um, they, everyone isolates because the world feels very unsafe until they learn how to yeah. work, you know, live within it. Um, the third one is depressive symptoms, which I think we all understand, but just, you could touch upon that. And you could say, you say that depressive symptoms are the brain's way of checking out when it feels overwhelmed. So explain that to us. Um, yeah, I, I think in that one, a lot of times what I see is a negative worldview. So a shift towards the pessimistic. So believing that things will never work out for me. And sometimes, especially after childhood trauma, um, 
a lot of times with um, narcissistic abuse, this would happen is we kind of turn the shame inwards and we accept what was given to us and yes. say, oh, there's something wrong with me that this happened. And so a lot of times that negative worldview will shift towards ourselves and see ourselves in a very negative light. So we start to believe that we deserve bad things to happen and that um, it's inevitable because of who we are. So, so much of the the work in that is, is redefining that sense of self and finding self-compassion and self-worth. Yes, I totally agree with that. Um, let's see, that was, okay. So let's just kind of move on to um, complex trauma. <clears throat> and, you know, under there, you make the statement that everyone's doing the best they can. You believe that, but this doesn't stop us from being accountable to the pain we might inflict. Um, there are anyone who's had more than one traumatic response happen in different circumstances would be diagnosed with complex trauma. So I want you to, um, if you would, please talk to us about this. And this is something that not all practitioners recognize. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a huge problem. Um, people like Bessel van der Kolk have been trying, fighting for decades to try to get this into the DSM. Um, I think one of the pushbacks is that if you were to put complex trauma in the DSM, which is the the big book that psychiatrists like to, to use to diagnose folks, which was intended for billing, not really intended to be the Bible, but <laughs> that's what happened. Um, it would actually really negate a lot of the diagnoses that are in there, which mm. have been historically in there for a long time. So especially personality disorders, I think of a lot of them as responses to complex trauma, in including narcissism, to be honest. Yes. Um, Brene Brown has done a lot of research on that. Um, narcissists tend to be among the most self-loathing of people. Um, and that wound doesn't come out of nowhere. So um, I, I think complex trauma is now, interestingly, a billing code in the ICD-11, which means um, for everyone who uses billings around the world, we have a diagnostic code attached to everything that we see. And even though the DSM doesn't list it, we can now bill for it. So it's, it's this really interesting position we are in medicine and folks who are in the psychology world is that one of the global bodies recognizes it, but the one that's more tied to the pharmaceutical industry doesn't. And I think it's because there is no pharmaceutical treatment for complex trauma, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, True. So that's my theory about it. Uh, What's the, um, term that, that play, what, you, you use the initials, but what is the, um, the agency or the, the, that, that is accepting this diagnosis? What is this called? You said the I something. Yeah, I, I, it's like international codes of okay. diagnosis or something. Okay, like I, something we, we like don't that. even ever use the the full name. It's a good okay. question. I'm gonna I'm gonna look that okay. up. Just curious um, because I know another guest had talked about that, you know, and I had never heard of that, but now you're saying it too. So I just wanted to kind of refresh my memory, but that's okay. And this um, is international statistical classification of diseases and related health problems. It's uh, uh, the WHO, actually. Okay. Okay. So okay, that's what it is. I'm really glad to learn that. I didn't know that either. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I asked. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> and, and I do think the WHO is really advancing in a lot of areas that um, some other bodies are slower to catch on to because it is a global body and it is more informed by folks that are not as driven by industry. Um, they need more grassroots solutions. They need more DIY solutions, which is very much why I put the book out. I've been doing international work for um, about 12, 13 years now. And uh, one of the things that I notice is that so many cultures have ways of managing trauma that are non-pharmaceutical and they're really effective. So one of the many, many rabbit holes I've gone down is, well, what are the ancestral and different cultural ways that trauma healing happens in addition to what are the body-based ways that you know we don't need a psychiatrist to, to to learn we can do this in community um i think community aid and mutual aid are going to become bigger and bigger resources for us as time goes on wow that is so positive um can you be a little more specific with like something that may be happening in another um 
country. Well, for example, in the modern trauma toolkit, I include somatic practices. So body-based practices that you can easily learn in a couple minutes. So I explain them in the chapter. These are things like havening techniques, tapping, and tremoring. And in all three of those training programs, there's no gatekeeper. Literally anyone can sign up to learn these things and then they can practice them. So whether or not you're a teacher, I mean, how many dysregulated kids are there out there? And if you could teach them a super simple self-soothing skill, like that helps them regulate their emotions, mm -hmm. then you can have a kid who's in a challenging situation at home and doesn't lay down trauma responses because they can actually learn how to curtail them and bring them into the conscious awareness and regulate themselves. So this is what I'm hoping the world can gain. This is why I'm on TikTok and I'm writing books that are accessible for folks is that I really believe that the, um, and then imagine if a teacher can teach her whole classroom, you know? So that to me is community care. Um, uh, a person who works um, as a receptionist and they're dealing with the public and they can co-regulate so their nervous system stays really neutral even in the face of fight, flight, or freeze in front of them, that co-regulation is going to help everyone who's in front of them that day. Oh, so I really wow. think that the more we expand everyone's toolkit and help them learn the tools to manage their own nervous system responses, we... Um, we give them control back that was taken from them at such a young age often. Love it. Oh, wow. Wouldn't that be so great if that was incorporated? There's so many things that should be incorporated as far as um, mental health tools for, um, for kids. It, it, there's so many things that could really help them. And I love that idea. Uh, tapping's an easy one. Kids yeah, I'm a huge fan. Um, and it's evidence-based now. So one of the things that I'm really enjoying is that as time goes on, there is more and more research happening around the body-based tools that I've been learning. Because I initially, when I started studying this, I got a lot of pushback from the medical community, especially when we call things energy psychology. And I'm like, what are you talking about, docs? I mean, you measure energy all the time with an ECG of the heart waves and an EEG of the brain waves. I mean, we, we are an energy-based science. How could you not heal through energy too? Well... So you felt all this pushback, but you just kept moving forward. I had to quit a few jobs, <laughs> but I've, I've found really nice places to land now that um, see the effect of what it is that I do. Um, and even if they don't understand it, they're more than happy to facilitate. So right. you just have to find the right environment. And it, it sometimes takes time. Um, right. But uh, for me, it was really important to land in equity deserving spaces with folks who couldn't access really expensive practitioners who do this. And I mean, it's not to say it's not worth it. It's just some folks don't have that potential. So right. in Canada, a doctor is free, but a psychologist isn't. And oh, wow. yeah, so I, I thought, well, if I'm the free one, then I better get out there. So I work in refugee health and addiction medicine and folks who have had very significant childhood trauma. Um, I'm not taking new patients, but that's why mm -hmm. I'm trying to do system level work with this other um information I, I call it knowledge translation but it's basically like taking these complex ideas and sharing them in a way that's really easy to understand and that's my that's the goal of my my current career i think that's wonderful my son is um he's a surgeon he's just about a year out of um out of his um residency but you know and <clears throat> I raised him very holistically, but you know, that doesn't work when you're a resident and you're, you have to follow the, the protocol, you know, and everything. So he's, he's finding a balance there, but you know, as a surgeon, there's, it's pretty cut and dry. <clears throat> well, there, there are more and more integrated <clears throat> practitioners I'm learning. So mm -hmm. even I, I've been studying things like lifestyle medicine, I've taken some integrated <clears throat> medicine courses, and there are more and more of us that are trying to bridge the, um, <laughs> the, the, the new Western medicine and the even newer mm -hmm. forms of complementary therapies, which often have their roots in 10,000 year old ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we, we kind of appropriate, like even you and I talked about polyvagal theory, which is chapter three in the book. And I really wanted everyone to understand this, especially doctors, because to me, it just helped me understand the way that people show up in such a new way and such a 
um, solution focused way that I'm like, oh, this is what's happening. You're in freeze or this is what's happening. You're stuck in sympathetic tone. Your body wants to move. Let's figure out how to work with that. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started, I, I also mm -hmm. studied Ayurvedic medicine. I, I, I did Ayurvedic counseling out of Kerala Academy. Mm -hmm. And I found out that this concept of polyvagal theory completely matches the gunas in Ayurvedic me oh, medicine wow. from 10,000 years ago. And if you line up the way that they conceive of um, the states of our mental system, mm -hmm. um, they call it sattva, which is calm and relaxed and very connected to our higher self, which is ventral vagal in polyvagal theory and where we can be safe and calm and connected to others and ourselves. Um, they call it tamas mm -hmm. when we are still and slow and have very low, sometimes depressive energy, which matches that dorsal vagal state. And then they call it rajasic, which is lots of high movement, mm. um, agitated, restless energy, which very much matches um, the sympathetic state. So when I put that all together, I thought, how much of this is just us reinventing things that are already known, including ways that we used to handle trauma that we have kind of socially conditioned ourselves out of tremoring for example we are all um created to shiver when we've been through especially traumatic events and i know it once happened to me after a car accident um and the way that tremoring was conceived of it was a social worker working in a war zone and he noticed that the folks who would naturally shiver when they were scared um were the ones who didn't have as much ptsd so he taught everyone to do it okay. and Tremoring is something that we can just release our sympathetic tone. I, I do it all the time at the end of the day, which is just the way a dog or a horse or any other mammal is capable of shaking off stress. And it turns out humans are supposed to do that too. But because of social conditioning, we no longer do it. So part of my curiosity was to learn what are the things we already innately know and just have been kind of collectively forgetting. I think that's so cool. That's so cool. Um, yeah, I'm a big um, proponent of Chinese medicine and all the ancient medicines because my throughout my life, <clears throat> Western medicine has not addressed most of the issues that I have. So I've had to be very, you know, um, creative. <laughs> I've done Ayurvedic. I've done. I've been through all the different kinds of healing methods. But it's really interesting to know that this polyvagal theory is it goes back that far. Really interesting. Um, you say that um, being trauma informed. Okay, so <clears throat> where was my page? Okay, it's not always the incident that causes it. It could be a tone of voice. It could be a glance, oh, the way somebody looks at you. It could be posturing, right? Yeah, it can cause us to have trauma responses, right? Yeah, I think one of the really important tools that Stephen Porges helped me understand was how much of the, the vagus nerve that's in our face affects how we feel and how we project safety. So one thing I'm really careful to do, both in the audiobook, which I was so lucky to read, because I said to my publisher when they, you know, we were signing the contracts, I said, it's really important that the person who reads this book have a soft and melodic and nurturing voice. <laughs> and they said, well, well, you can aud audition for that. <laughs> um, luckily, I got chosen, but I, I was really nervous because sometimes you read an audiobook and it's like in clipped academic, mm. you know, very distanced language or, or like tone of voice and and way of enunciating, and that wouldn't have felt good. So one of the things that I learned from polyvagal theory is your tone of voice and the way that you use your facial expressions are so important for us as safety cues, even in our subconscious mind. Like we don't have to think through and is this person safe? Listen to their voice and watch how their mouth moves and are their eyes naturally smiling or are their eyes feeling cold? Our our brains just do this automatically. We're we're evolved that way. I think all mammals do that. And some some mammals have special like synesthesia powers where they can even, you know, sense our emotions. Like, I mean, my dog knows exactly when I need some extra cuddles, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think humans have probably more synesthesia where we 
have the ability to use more than the six senses that we talk about, mm -hmm. but we've been kind of conditioned out of it. And folks who've been through trauma, they'll often get labeled as highly sensitive person or empath. And to me, it's actually like an awakening of your synesthesia because mm -hmm. so many of us are able to read the emotions of others. And when you've been in unsafe situations, you have to hone that skill just to stay safe. And so that part of your mind body system strengthens. And I think mm -hmm. we all have that capacity. And I, I always tell my folks that I work with who have significant complex trauma that even though this is sometimes difficult, this can be one of your superpowers. And it makes you such a compassionate person if you can uh, differentiate between compassion and empathy. You don't have to necessarily feel the same feelings as others, but you can walk alongside their feelings. Um, I'm sure you've had to do this as a coach with uh Well, with right. And, and there's a, cha a whole chapter in my book, Close Encounters of the Worst Kind, about the empath. And um, yeah. I, I'm in full agreement with you. I can... When somebody comes to me as an adult child of narcissistic abuse, I, I already know they're energetically sensitive. Yeah. Because you can't get through childhood uh, in an environment like that. You can't survive it without becoming energetically aware. And that's, that's a skill that you take with you forever. But it's also part of, you know, when you talk about people isolating, it's also part of the isolation because until they understand that they have this sensitivity, it's not just being afraid of people, it's feeling the energies of people too, when they're out and about. So there's a lot that they have to understand about themselves and what has happened in order for them to be able to integrate back into the world. But the tone of voice um, is really important. And I, you know, I was thinking back as you were saying that raising my children, I did it all with tone of voice. Mm -hmm. I was always really calm. When my voice would go up a little bit, they knew Mom was getting a little bit worked up. And when it went up a little bit more, I didn't have to yell. But they knew the change in the tone. And they knew to snap to it when the tone got <laughs> changed. But yes, you know, but, you know, I grew up in a home, a dysfunctional home with a narcissistic mother. And I mean, my gosh, the facial and the tone and the, the whole body language was terrifying at times. So mm -hmm. you're right. You're absolutely right. Well, and I, I really love, I, I was going to touch on the thing that you said around the empath being in a room and being really drained by everyone's emotions. So there, there's two things that I always share with folks is um, that you actually have to think of complex trauma a little bit like a disability in that you have to conserve your energy quite carefully. Um, so one of the reasons I put spoon theory in the modern trauma toolkit is because there's so many correlations for me between folks who've been through complex trauma, both in that they're more prone to getting diseases because their immune system isn't always working at its mm -hmm. best, mm -hmm. but also because they really have to conserve their energy. And um, spoon theory is a little bit like a gas tank where you just have to notice what's draining you and what fills you up and make sure that you're conserving your energy for the things that you have to do in a day, because a lot of times people and their emotions can really drain it. So it's one of the reasons that I love both havening and tapping because it kind of helps you lower the intensity on these emotions that you might be experiencing. So it doesn't turn them off altogether. Emotions are important messages, but you just want to be able to turn down the volume dial when it's too intense for your system. Talk about, and the these spoon just talk about the spooning because I that was the first time I'd ever heard it. I read it in your book. Talk about what that is. Yeah, so Spoon Theory was um, invented by a woman uh, also named Christine, interestingly, and she had lupus and she was um, talking in a cafe with a friend of hers about um, what it was like to have a disability that is kind of invisible. Like she, when you looked at her, unless she had the rash on her face, you wouldn't really know that she had lupus, but the way that it affects her is quite significant. And she was kind of hurt by this friend who didn't, who's accompanied to her her to some of her doctor's appointments, but still didn't seem to understand that she had a lower reserve tank. So she she took a bunch of spoons off the tables in the, the restaurant and she said, okay, imagine you start the day with 12 spoons and I'm making the numbers up because I, I, I didn't find a reference that actually listed the exact numbers. But she said, um, a person who has chronic disease, and I actually think complex trauma does the same thing to your system. Mm -hmm. You're starting the day with six spoons or eight spoons. And so people assume you can do all of these things because they have a 12 spoon day and you're starting the day with six spoons and you have to be so careful where you spend those spoons because 
being out in public and taking on the energy of others, that might be a two spoon event and you'll leave that event and maybe it's just a medical appointment, um, but you'll come home and you'll just feel so drained and someone else will say, well, why aren't you making dinner? Um, I actually can't. I'm, I'm out of spoons. I need to replenish these. So the, it, it's very analogous, analogous to a gas tank or a battery but um, there is a spoony community. And so folks who have chronic disease, a lot of them will call themselves spoonies. And it's a way of sharing care in community and saying, mm -hmm. yeah, me too. Like, I really have to pace myself. I really don't have the energy level that everyone expects me to have um, with these invisible disabilities. And um, once you've been through complex trauma, um, there, there was an amazing medical study that I, I mentioned in the Modern Trauma Toolkit that happened in 1999, and it really should have changed all of medicine, but it basically says that every event that you have related to abuse or neglect or significant challenges in childhood, it exponentially increases your risk of not just mental health issues, but also physical and social health. And to me, it's the biggest risk factor for anything that I used to see in primary care. And it's one of the main reasons why I've pivoted to working with trauma is because I think of this as in public health, we call this a downstream intervention. But what it basically means is you're getting at the root causes. And rather than me trying to manage diabetes or, you know, manage a person who's unhoused, if I treat trauma, mm -hmm. I help their nervous system and everything changes. So when I was doing trauma work as a family doctor, I started to realize that it was the most useful thing that I did. It is so useful. And, you know, I can relate to the spoon theory because I never start the day with 12. I have autoimmune and yeah. I start the day with half and anything can take spoons from me. Um, so, you know, so at the end of some days, I'm just like a wrung out rag. I mean, I just have nothing left. That happened to me yesterday. Um, yeah. so I get it, you know, I get it. And, and over the years, you know, I think when you have that, those limitations, you tend to want to fight it and be like everybody else. But after a while you have to settle into it and you have to go, no, it's just my nature. And, um, the, the less you resist it, the better off you are with it. I do agree. Although I, one of the things that I found is some therapies can be really, really draining and hard to get through. So EMDR, sometimes that people end up having to drop out. This is the eye movement desensitization treatment. Mm -hmm. So I trained in a modern version of it called accelerated resolution therapy, where you can do the same treatment basically in a single session. Mm -hmm. And so imagine instead of having to go in for eight, 10, 12 sessions, you can go in for one hour and a half session and work through a lot of those themes at one time. So I... I really do feel like major shifts can happen. And I've worked with lots of folks who um, were feeling very stuck in the way that their nervous system and mind body system worked. And we were able to shift it really gently mm -hmm. through therapies like tapping. Um, tapping has a version called matrix re-imprinting where you can actually change the foundational beliefs at the moment that they happen. Mm -hmm. It is like magic. I, I call it quantum therapy, but it's also really gentle and sweet. And people finish these sessions and they feel energized. They feel fantastic. And that's what I love to do in therapy is I don't want to come in there and have you totally drained at the end of the session. I want you to leave that session feeling magical, feeling, feeling. What was the, um, what was the abbreviated um, EMDR that you talked about? What's it called? Uh, accelerated resolution therapy. Okay. Um, it was the first trauma technique that I learned and it was so effective. Like I was having my diabetic patients were having their results. Um, I was having people control asthma and allergies and all kinds of things. And I was starting to do it with almost every single one of my family practice patients. So then the other docs in the clinic started referring to me and it just became such an overwhelming need that I recognized I, I have to do more of this. So it's not the only tool in my toolkit now for trauma processing, which is kind of the second phase of trauma treatment, but it is definitely one of the most effective tools. And honestly, it can sometimes be fun, which is so different because like polyvagal theory teaches us that if we can do things that are playful and that 
and allows us to activate both our calm ventral nervous system and our sympathetic movement system at the same time, we can actually neutralize some of these um, traumatic memories. We can detach the traumatic associations from them during that session. Mm -hmm. And I find it incredibly effective. So um, we will measure like how intense does this memory affect you? And you'll, you'll, you'll think of a movie of the memories that you want to shift at the beginning of the session. And then at the end of the session, most people, it's a totally neutral memory, something that has been bothering them their whole life. Um, no longer has that same emotional and sen physical sensations mm -hmm. come up when you think about it. So um, I, I do believe that it's not necessarily your destiny, even if this is the way your nervous system has always been. There are so many new ways to treat it. Mm -hmm. um, I was just on a podcast yesterday with an EFT practitioner, and she calls this the fourth wave of therapy, where we're doing more somatic work, we do more guided imagery, and it's really gentle and nurturing. And so even though I can't teach people to do accelerated resolution therapy in the book, what I wanted to do is to teach the things that you can do on your own to learn that path in the phase one of trauma therapy is establishing safety in the body and learning that you could be safe because so many people mm -hmm. haven't had that experience yet. Exactly. Exactly. Most people that have had trauma don't know what it means to feel safe because yeah. they haven't felt safe in so long. Their body is just responding. Their body is just so heightened. The, the, the nervous response is so heightened that that becomes a norm and they don't know what it's like to, to be calm. Yeah. Talk about havening. What is havening? Um, havening is one of my favorite therapeutic techniques. Um, it is, so the, the people who created it just looked at some basic science research showing that there's many things that we can naturally do with our body that will create calm brainwaves. So this was measured with a, a band um, of EEG wave recordings. And when the people were noticing delta and theta waves, which are really calm, restful states for our brain, these will increase when we do certain things with our body. So one of those things are eye movements, which is why EMDR works and accelerated resolution therapy works. Part of the protocol is to move the eyes from side to side, um, to cross the midline. So moving the eyes from side to side alone is something very calming for the human body. Um, the havening techniques used self-touch. And it's three very simple um, areas of the body that we can brush gently with the, the fingertips of one hand. So one would be the palm of the opposite hand and you would just really, really gently brush like you're brushing a kitten or a puppy. Um, so you would brush with the opposite hand. The other one is from the shoulder to the elbow. Um, and you can do that with both sides at the same time. We call that the moving hug. That's uh, Kate Truitt's term. She's my favorite teacher for havening. Um, we really gently move the fingers across the cheekbones and the forehead and the eyebrows. Mm. Um, all of this, especially the face actually, creates delta and theta waves, which are calming, and it decreases gamma waves. And so when I did the training, um, they had a, each of us volunteer to do a session with the trainer, and they actually attached a, an EEG band, so that's called the, the Muse band, and they projected the findings on the screen. And it was wild because every single person who did the the um, demonstration, you could see in real time the gamma waves dropping and the delta theta waves increasing. Um, and the body movements alone aren't the full technique. So a lot of times what you'll do is add some imagery. So for example, it might be breathing in, self-care, breathing out, shame. And you might even imagine what the color and the texture and the temperature of what you're breathing in and out might look like. So that's transpirational havening. Um, one of my favorite things that I teach on TikTok is affirmations. And I, I go into a, a huge segment in the Modern Trauma Toolkit about it because it's such a fun tool to use. But it's basically taking an affirmation like, um, I deserve love, I am safe, and 
these can be really hard for folks who've been through complex trauma because they simply don't believe it. You can say an affirmation and it actually feels like gaslighting to some people where they're lying to themselves. But imagine if you just put a what if in front of it and you say, what if I could imagine a time in the future that I deserve love? What if I could be safe? Hmm. And even just that possibility that you plant in the mind opens new doorways. And so the opposite of trauma isn't being happy all the time. That's not the human experience. The opposite of trauma is having flexibility in responses. Mm. So, so planting these informations, what if mm. just opens up the brain to new possibilities so that you're not always feeling like I'm always in danger or um, I must deserve bad things to happen. You're just opening new doorways. That's awesome. So, yeah, I, I love havening because there's so many different techniques that you can learn. I outline most of them in the book. And then there's a 20 minute video in the QR code from the introduction. And you can watch the video if that's an easier way for you to learn. Um, and I go through that some of the different techniques there too. But there are so many. Um, and uh, I'm still learning. Uh, I still take Kate's trainings all the time. I, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm never going to stop finding new ways that uh, the body has innate healing properties because we have the power to reverse these trauma responses. We just don't have that as public knowledge yet, but hopefully someday we will. This is so important, Christy. I'm so glad that you're sharing this with us. You know, it adds... it. it Hope is really important when you're struggling and um, the fact that there's no dead ends, you know, that we're not going to hit walls because there's so many practitioners that people go to where they do hit a wall and then they feel like there's something wrong with them and, you know, and then they sort of shrink because it's like, okay, well, you know, they don't understand it. Nobody understands it. And they're telling me something's wrong with me. I, I can't tell you how many doctors have told me through the years. There's nothing wrong with you. I'm like, I say, I'm the healthiest person that never feels well. So, mm. <laughs> I mean, my blood works perfect. My imaging's perfect. Everything is perfect. My heart rate, my blood pressure, you know. And yet there's a whole host of stuff from my nervous system that never yeah. regulated to normal. Never. Well, and there's two other ways that it shows up that doctors aren't very good at recognizing, but a lot of folks who have chronic pain or unexplained symptoms, like I'll have so many patients say to me, I put my clothes on and my clothes hurt. Mm -hmm. Like they have so much sensitivity in their skin. And what ends up happening when you've been in danger for a long time is the brain upregulates the... Um, the smoke detectors. So that's your amygdalas in the middle of your brain. And they're looking for danger. They're scanning for danger. And once you've been in danger, they get more sensitive um, or they suppress the signals because sometimes when there's nothing you can escape from, it just buries the signals for a long time. So sometimes people lose the connection from their body signals and they can't actually um, hear them anymore. Mm -hmm. And for some people, the volume dial just goes way up. Mm -hmm. And so everything that's happening in your body, including neutral things, are experienced and perceived in your brain as uncomfortable and even sometimes dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I'll have so many folks who will have um, migraines, uh, belly pains, like chronic pelvic pain, and this is how a lot of refugees will present because I work in refugee health as well, because they don't, they're not socially conditioned to say, oh, I think I'm depressed. They'll show up and say, I have this abdominal pain that won't go away. And it's actually just their normal digestive processes and it makes them feel so ill. Wow. Although there's also, we're starting to understand things like the microbiome. So when I say there's no pill to help trauma, I'm not totally sure about that because people are doing amazing things with fecal transplants, um, also psychedelic medicine. So there are some pills that are on the horizon to being main, mainstream that I do think could shift. So our microbiome is like the bacterial environment inside our intestines, and we're starting to recognize how much that's connected to what's happening in our brains. So I'm really hopeful that a lot more can continue to change. Um, and it's why I really believe that Anything that's connecting the mind and the body together is going to be so much more effective. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish more physicians were aware of all of this. So I'm when I do try to sell the book, I'm I'm trying to sell it at medical conventions and places where family doctors might be because mm -hmm. 
um, the more that we get this into training programs and and help people understand this, the better we will be at listening to patients and, and saying, oh, yeah, you're having a signaling or a perception issue. Or, hey, maybe you've been in so much sympathetic tone and your immune system has been shut off for your entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and so how can we look at autoimmune conditions and other ways that that could show up? So um, we have to get wonderful. better at listening. <laughs> Yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, it would be. <laughs> it really would help so many people. Yeah, there's a there's a big gap here um, between um, in, in a lot of ways between the psychology, the way they're trained, and what people need, and the medical community, the way they're trained, and what people need. There, you know. But I know things are rapidly advancing. I wanted to talk to you about. Um, you talk about the container, practicing the container, and it's about giving shame back. So let's can this we is, just go over that. I think that's cool. Yeah, this is this is a really powerful technique for folks who've been through narcissistic abuse in particular, um, because so much of the time, when you have a parent who's not trying to meet your needs or whose needs seem to be dominating yours, or they're creating a really chaotic environment, um, we start to believe that there's something deeply wrong with us because it's actually easier for a kid to believe there's something wrong with us and we don't deserve good care than to believe that our parent isn't capable of caring for us right, that's because that's right. actually scarier. That threatens our survival. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we turn the wound inwards and say, oh, there's something wrong with me that I'm not getting the care that I need, um, we add a lot of shame into our systems and somehow it's safer than believing that the parent is the issue. So wow. a lot of the folks that I work with, they have a core wound of shame. And every time that they're facing their triggers, that they're dealing with mm -hmm. relationships, this, this core wound shows up. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the thinking brain isn't always good at processing these core wounds because sometimes they were laid down before the age of three, before we even have language. So we call that pre-verbal trauma. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's ancestral trauma, like lots of folks who are First Nations, who are racialized and, mm -hmm. and have this like ancestral history of slavery or collective traumas. This stuff, it ends up in our bones and we don't have a language for it because it's just stuck in our tissues. And we actually can't access the, the original memory. So there's lots of body-based ways that we can still unlock those pathways. And that's what I love about the somatic tools is because you can access the shame without accessing the language around shame. So the yeah. container uses imagery and it says, I want you to imagine a container that you would put these painful emotions I use shame quite often. Just put all your shame in the container. Don't look at it. Just put it in the container. Um, how heavy is it? What does the box look like? How many locks are on it? Um, is it old? Uh, and, and just get all the details of the container so that they can really visualize the container. And then they get to decide where to put it. So the first element of the container is keeping the nervous system in a calm place. So the container technique that I'm describing is something that they use with emotional freedom techniques, which is um, a cousin of traditional Chinese medicine. It's basically self acupressure, where you would tap different parts of your body. And this affects the energy systems and the emotional meridians. And the evidence has shown that it helps people lower the levels of emotions and physical sensations that they feel. So first you get them in that calm body where they're in that window of tolerance, which means that they can cope with what's happening. Okay. And then you have them do the container method. So it's really important to do both, to have them be in a calm body first and then to work on the metaphor. So the language of our subconscious mind is imagery and metaphor. It's not English. And so for everyone who's been forced through a CBT program, the reason you can't think your way out of trauma is because so much of what's happened to you is in your subconscious. And you can't think your way out of that, yeah. but you can use metaphor. So the metaphor of creating this container, putting the shame inside and then deciding where it goes. For some people, they'll tuck it under the stairs in the basement and we might just take one piece of shame out at a time for other people they actually have to like um 
they have to ring the doorbell at their parents, like the house that they grew up in. And then they leave the box on the, and then they run up, they run down the street. That's so um, funny. But we, we make it fun and playful that way. We were like, okay, like, how are we going to do this? So like, you don't have to see them, but we're still going to leave it at the house. Um, so sometimes they'll just stick it in the garden. Um, but ways that they might give it back to their parenting units, their caregivers. Um, some people shoot it into space, drop it in the ocean, throw it off a cliff, just get rid of it. Um, but the way that we use these imagery um, in a playful way keeps us in a calm body while we're still dealing with some of these core wounds. So I find the container method really powerful. And eventually what I'll do when they're feeling like they're more calm is we'll process the core memories using something like matrix re-imprinting or accelerated resolution therapy. But they can stay calm during that whole practice because we've done these subconscious shifts. Um, and we've cleared a lot of those uh, associations and it's so powerful. It sounds really powerful. It's wonderful. You know, I picked up on the fact that you said parenting units. It reminded me of the Coneheads from Saturday Night Live. They would, oh, they, yeah. they would call themselves parental units. Oh, funny. I didn't know that. And, you know, um, my sisters and I used to say that about our parents because they didn't feel like parents. They were more mm -hmm. like we would call them the, our parental units. So <laughs> sometimes that helps people, you know, to take away the <clears throat> that um, attachment of what a mother's supposed to be, what a father's supposed to be. Sometimes you just need to call them units. That's great. You know, I did that super subconsciously, but I, I have had to change my language a lot because a lot of times if I suggest the word mother, it doesn't resonate for my patients. Like they'll they'll either call them by their first name or they have like a nickname for them. Um, but the word mother kind of denotes nurturing and that's not what they experienced. And so that that word is really wrong. And I mean, also recognizing that families come in all shapes and sizes. You could have two fathers, you could have a trans mom. Like, like there's so many ways that families show up and I don't want to make any of those feel wrong. But mostly it's a trauma informed language to, to, to not assume that the word mother resonates because for so many folks, it doesn't. It doesn't. I know um, it's a real sore spot, sticking point for most of my clients who are coming to me um, as adults who have had childhood narcissistic abuse. They're very hung up on the mother and father labels um, and mm. what comes with that. And they have a very hard time moving past that illusion of what it should be versus what it is. It's confusing because I'll say, I usually will say, well, do you love your parents? Oh yes, I love my parents. Okay, so what do you love? What did they do? You know, well, they fed me, they put a roof over my head. Um, they took, took, made sure I went to school and they took me to the doctor. I said, okay, well, that's the legal responsibility. So what did they do for you, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And it's very hard for people to begin to take it away, take it apart. So often I will have them label the parent in a different way to get them off of the mother father, because that's a tough one to let go of. But it's interesting that people come to you already like that. Well, and I'm probably more sensitive to it too. So if I say the word mother and I can track their mm -hmm. nervous system because I'm getting better at that, and there's like a flinch or there's like a, even a twitch of the lip, I'll say, does that word work? And then we start to actually have that conversation. So, um, not everyone tracks these things. So uh, I'm learning from my patients. <laughs> um, so you know, the people with lived experience are the best teachers. It's another reason why I love TikTok so much is because there's so many community members sharing their experience. And that's such an um, a incredible gift to those of us doing the work too. Mm -hmm. You're doing amazing work, Christy. I, I'm just so... Um... I don't even want to use the word impressed. I just, you have really put so much thought into this, into helping people. And this is so badly needed. We're, we're very, very, this society is very hurt. Um, and we do need these tools. And this book, um, the Modern Trauma Toolkit is great. Um, everybody really should pick up a copy of this. Let me move it over. I could never get this right. Okay, there it is. And if you're in the States, Amazon has it on a huge sale right now. Like, well, oh. last time I checked, it was like $14 and it's supposed to be 20. So oh. um, I don't usually recommend Amazon. I usually say, hey, support your local mom and pop bookshop or um, let's get away from that language. Let's just say your local small bookstore. Um, but 
uh, that's a really big deal. <laughs> so that is. I will, wow. I will send people they did that without your authorization? Well, it, do, it, it doesn't bother me or my publisher. That, right. That's Amazon who loses the money. So I'm all for that. Okay. Um, like they, okay. they bought the books from the publisher for the same price. So right. um, exactly. we're, we're totally fine with that. Okay. Right. I just I mean, honestly, I... I didn't even let them release the book in hardcover because my goal was to get this book in as many hands as possible. I'm not out here trying to make money or try to be the guru on this. I just want people to have the knowledge. So whatever it takes for me to get that knowledge out there. I'm, I'm trying to do lots of speaking engagements, but my whole goal is to just get the knowledge in people's hands. And that includes doctors and psychologists because we, um, there's a lot that we don't understand yet and, and we can continue to perpetuate harm and, and, and just not see what's in front of us. So, and then that, and I, I'm not, that sounds like I'm blaming them and I'm not, it's just, it's the wrong paradigm. The way that we've been taught about the mind versus the body and the way that trauma affects us, um, we're just not taught all of the things that we could know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that does promote shame and make people feel like there's something wrong with them, you know, that they don't, you know, I, I mean, most people feel like there's something wrong with them and most people don't feel normal. It's very difficult um, in this world to, to get a, a, a healthy perspective on yourself. There's so yeah. much, comp, comp, you know, comparison and social media and especially ch kids and um, adolescents, teenagers. Yeah, it's you're really absolutely right. Hard. And I, I think um, <clears throat> there are some amazing practitioners out there. And I think that part that I wanted to be quite different was to speak in a really nurturing voice because a lot of them speak like academics and they they know all the things mm -hmm. and what I wanted to do was to come a bit more humble a bit more curious a bit more open and make sure that I try and I'm still learning how to do this because it certainly isn't how I was trained but to try to be more of a nurturing figure because this is what people were missing. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have that sense of being nurtured through this. And even if you read a lot of the books that are out there, they'll, they'll kind of, um, they'll, they'll speak in really jargony language where the, the words are really big and it's hard to understand, mm -hmm. or they'll go through the process from a really distanced perspective and not be like, Hey, we're mm -hmm. in this together. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really true. Like I, you know, I, I, I'm not immune from trauma. Even I'm sure your son, the surgeon would say how traumatic residency was. I mean, we put medical students through absolute hell Horrible. and then we appreciate mm -hmm. like, like we don't understand how much it changes them to go through that. It's, it's tragic. And so I, I also want to share with physicians, like how much trauma is stored in our bodies. And it was so great for me because I studied like a dozen different modalities. And through that, I released a lot of the trauma of my training and, and my practice. Um, wow. yeah. You know, even just bearing witness to death and suffering, we we hold that in our tissues and we can enact that on other people. Well, and I noticed, you, you know, as he went, um, as he was going through this resident training, I noticed his empathy level was was dropping because the surgeries that he has to do sometimes he has to see horrific things and do horrific things. And, you know, you ha almost have to numb yourself to be able to get through that. And it, he was also working in a, with a burn unit and, mm. um, you know, he just yeah. did, did a lot of amputations and stuff like that. Doesn't even, we, after a while, it didn't even bother him, you know? We learn to dissociate for our own safety. And sometimes we learn this as kids and sometimes we learn this as practitioners. And mm -hmm. I always say like dissociation or substance use or any kind of addictive behavior or, or shutting down and collapsing, all of this is protective mm -hmm. until you learn new ways of being that you can stay safe. And so we'd learn these other ways of showing up to create a sense of safety. And for a lot of physicians, it's dissociating. We totally disconnect from the pain and suffering that's in mm -hmm. front of us mm -hmm. and patients can feel it. So one of the hardest things I had to relearn was to be able to, to, to see and witness and acknowledge and work with the pain in front of me without taking it on myself. And that we call that vicarious trauma. So um, these are things that we need to understand better as professionals too. That's so true. I mean, I do work, you know, pretty heavy, heavy work um, with people and, um, I don't take on the pain or the trauma, but that's something that's come 
after years of working on myself, because if I would have done this many, many, many years ago, uh, I would have been a basket case. I would, not, I would have taken it all on. So yeah, you have to, you've got to find that balance. Well, gosh, it's great talking to you. Um, I'm so happy um, to meet you and um, just thrilled to hear the work that you're doing. This book is fantastic. Everybody should get a copy. And I'm going to go back through this because I know I can learn from you who you've learned from others. And um, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank yeah, it's it. been it's, it's been a lovely conversation. It's yeah, nice it's to, talk to talk to somebody who who gets it. <laughs> I completely get it. Oh, we're on the same wavelength. Yeah. All right. Well, have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. All righty. Bye bye.